Okay, welcome everyone um, to our March Net Chatter. Um, lovely to see you all here. Um, and I'll pass over to Rachel to introduce our speaker for this month. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you, Selena. Well, welcome everyone to our March Net Chatter event through the Net Cancer Foundation. And we are honored and excited to have our speaker today, Dr. Nagla Abdel Karim. And let me introduce her briefly before she gets started. So she is currently the Director of Early Therapeutics at the Anova Shkar Cancer Institute and a professor of medicine at the University of Virginia. In addition to that, she has clinical and research interests that are focused on phase one clinical trials and the personal, personalized approach of therapy for patients with lung cancer. In addition to that, um, she is leading a subcommittee in thoracic nets um, of a SWOG group to develop new therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Abdel Karim is very dedicated to her research with nets, advocating for patients, and we are so excited to have here, her here today to learn more um, of what she's doing to advance the field of thoracic neuroendocrine tumors. So with that, I will pass it over. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, so I think we're going to do the presentation mode. Um, so I would say, let's see. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me today to speak. I will discuss a very critical topic, which is... Um, navigating thoracic neuroendocrine tumors from indolent to aggressive. So neuroendocrine tumors, as we all know, are considered rare and slowly growing tumors that arise from neuroendocrine cells. They account for one to 2% of all cancers. And of course, seem to be a not very frequent type of tumors. However, they have increased dramatically over the last 30 years. Maybe because we have better diagnostic techniques. Nets are arising anywhere in the body. Although it is most common to be found in the GI tract because of the high numbers of neuroendocrine cells necessary to regulate digestion and intestinal motility. However, the lung net accounts for like a third of those patients. So as we see, there are a third of those patients, and not only that, like 27% can have even metastatic disease with neuroendocrine tumors. Lung nets arise from pulmonary neuroendocrine cells, specialized high airway epithelial cells. They're located from the nasal respiratory epithelium down there, in the laryngeal mucosa and throughout the entire respiratory tract from trachea to the terminal airways. They comprise 2% of primary lung cancers with overall incidence of 1.35 over the 100,000 population. The spectrum of pulmonary neuroendocrine tumors range from dipench, which is diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, typical and atypical carcinoids, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, so that goes to aggressive, and small cell lung cancer, most aggressive. So looking at dipench, it is a generalized proliferation of pulmonary neuroendocrine cells. They may be confined to the mucosa of the airways and invade locally to form tumorlets. So if you see the first uh, figure there, these are tumorulates. Um, and they can develop into invasive neuroendocrine tumors as the carcinoid tumors. Due to the frequent presence of neuroendocrine tumorulates and hyperplasia in the background of resected peripheral well-differentiated lung nets, dipench is considered by the WHO to be a pre-invasive lesion. 
and is likely a precursor to pulmonary nets, mainly, of course, typical and atypical carcinoids. So as we see in the figure one, these are multiple carcinoid tumulates, less than five millimeter by definition. And here on figure two, on the high power, you can see that um, these are um, the closer look at the tumorillates, but of course you cannot um, say these are uh, tumorillates in the high power because it doesn't give you the dimension of the five millimeter size. At diagnosis, approximately half of those patients with dipenge have a synchronous, well-differentiated net. Dipenge is not associated with increased incidence of small cell lung cancer. Most symptomatic patients present with prolonged cough, dyspnea or breathlessness, wheezing, and misdiagnosed asthma. They can be uh, basically uh, coughing, and of course, uh, you'll need to have the appropriate diagnosis to manage those patients in a better way. As you see, the, there is something called obliterative bronchiolitis, which is present in some cases. And here, as you see the arrows, they highlight the submucosal fibrosis resulting in partial ob obstruction and obliteration. The lower arrow is on the smooth muscle of the bronchi bronchiole and the space between the arrows is filled with collagen. As you see on this figure, the chromogranin, of course, that's the mainstay stain for neuroendocrine tumors. And if you look at the last figure, basically, I mean, uh, chromogranin immunoperoxidase stain of bronchial, um, it, it shows those um, that it is um, very positive for neuroendocrine cells. There's a difference, of course, between the normal and the neuroendocrines uh, stained with um, the chromogranin. So lung cancer is a very common cancer. However, recently, the rates of lung cancer are, cancers are dropping in men and women, which is good. However, this is paired with an increase in incidence in lung neuroendocrine tumors. So we want to learn more as we see here that the KI67 proliferation index plays a role in grading of those pulmonary neuroendocrine tumors, where typical carcinoid has a lower KI67 proliferation index, followed by the atypical carcinoid. These are like low-grade tumors. Then coming more aggressive as large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas with higher KI67 proliferation index, followed by small cell lung cancer, which are like really higher grade and more aggressive and poorly differentiated. Looking at the histopathology, the typical carcinoid and atypical carcinoid, they're showing that they are well differentiated. As you see in the picture, they do have time because they're slow growing to differentiate, to draw. If I have time, I can draw. I can do more um, during that time. They have a mitotic index of less than 2, 2 to 10. KI67 here is less than 5%. With atypical carcinoid, it's more than 5%, but less than 20%. So continue to be well differentiated, uniform cells, and they are close to normal cells and tissue, but having abundant granules, as you see, because they are not healthy and they are not normal. When they become poorly differentiated, they are carcinomas, they are more aggressive, they have higher mitotic index of more than 10, and the KI67 is 40 to 100. And these are abnormal looking cells, as you see here, they are crazy, they are aggressive, they grow very fast, they do not have time to differentiate, they do not have time to have structure or to resemble any normal cells. They have irregular nuclei and they have less granules. So looking at the light microscopy closer, these are the well-differentiated carcinoids compared to the small cell lung cancer. Here are having neuros less neurosecretory granules in their cytoplasm. Again, they are uh, rapidly dividing and aggressive. What about the clinical picture for those patients? Well, looking at typical and atypical carcinoid, they tend to occur more in 
on the sixth decade of life, more in women and typical carcinoid really in never smokers. However, the atypical carcinoids sometimes in smokers. The mitotic index, zero to one compared to two to one. Necrosis does not happen with typical carcinoid. And necrosis is like, because they don't have time, they are multiplying quickly. Um, a lot of cells can die in, in their way and they have necrosis. They can't really um, be uh, well differentiated and they're like dead cells present. They can be focal in atypical carcinoid and a neuroendocrine morphology is present in both of them, of course, because they are neuroendocrine tumors. They are well differentiated, whether they're typical or atypical carcinoid with proliferative index, as I mentioned before, less than 5% in typical and less than 20%, but more than 5% in the atypical carcinoid. TTF1 is negative, which is a um, histopathologic marker for lung cancers. Synaptophysin and chromogranin would be positive and CD56 would be positive because these are the landmarks for our um, neuroendocrines. They are not combined with non-small cell lung cancer. Large cell and small cell lung cancer, on the other hand, occur more often in the, on the seventh decade in males associated with smoking, yes, has more than 10 of mitotic markers. They do have necrosis. They have neuroendocrine morphology, yes, but of course it's poorly differentiated morphology. They don't have time to grow. Um, 40 to 100% KI67 proliferative index, TTF1 more than 5%, synaptophysin and chromogranin positive in 82 to 90%, CD56 positive in 80 to 90%, and they can be combined with non-small cell lung cancer component. Most carcinoid tumors, they start in the large bronchi, in those large airways. And about a third of the patients with carcinoid tumors um, can be asymptomatic and the disease is identified incidentally. You see, now we have lung cancer screening programs, which can see some lung nodules and can be carcinoid tumors and asymptomatic. Symptoms can occur when the tumor increases in size and can cause cough, can cause hemoptysis or blood in bloody cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest pain, especially when taking deep breaths. Large carcinoids can cause partial or complete blockage or obstruction of those airways, and they can cause pneumonia. We do suspect basically bronchial tumors if we had a patient coming in with those persistent symptoms, they're, they're staying forever, or pneumonia, that's persistent in spite of antibiotic therapy. Carcinoid syndrome can have flushing and diarrhea. It's more common in GI neuroendocrine tumors. It's less common in thoracic neuroendocrine tumors. Sometimes, rare, um, rarely, that lung carcinoids can have secretion of hormones as ACTH. Surgery is the treatment of choice for lung neuroendocrine tumors and is the therapeutic option to offer cure. In general, it could be segmentectomy or wedge resection. It could be really just, you know, getting that area of the tumor taken out. And, you know, those um, can have also a negative margins, even if it's a low-grade tumor because you don't want to cut in the middle of the tumor. Lobectomy, bilobectomy, pneumonectomy are appropriate for more extensive low-grade neuroendocrine tumors, especially those located proximal. If we go ahead and do surgery and remove that typical or atypical carcinoid, do we really give adjuvant, adjuvant meaning like chemotherapy or additional systemic treatment afterwards? Well, we don't know. No study explored if there's any benefit for adjuvant therapy versus no treatment regardless of the nodal status. There is need for prospective studies to evaluate the utilization of adjuvant therapies in atypical carcinoid. We had an uh, abstract in, in, at NCCN um, in March 2021, and now it is a manuscript form in cancers because we collected all 
clinical trials that not clinical trials, even any articles or findings that people were using adjuvant chemotherapy. And it's very controversial, even though it's in the NCCN guidelines, but still it's a gray zone. It's not clear if we have benefit of adjuvant or maybe the selection of type of adjuvant, even if those patients have high risk um, as typical carcinoid, we do not have the best treatment or the best drug to use in this setting. How about patients who cannot have surgery? They are inoperable or they refuse surgery. They don't want to have surgery. Well, SBRT is also another um, choice and it has a dose intensive radiation, primarily for patients who cannot have surgery because they're not operable. It can be in areas where it's very difficult to reach or so on. I think it, it is a multidisciplinary decision between the surgeon, between the radiation oncologist, and also a patient would understand the risks and benefits of all those um, techniques. Well, what about if those carcinoids, typical or atypical carcinoid, become metastatic or become widespread or become advanced? It happens? Yes, it can happen, even though they're indolent, like they're slow, they're slowly growing, but still they can be not, I mean, they're not curable if they're spread in many places and we cannot do surgery for them. So Evrolimus is the only U.S. FDA approved treatment option in bronchopulmonary neuroendocrine tumors. It has a response rate of only 1.6%. Tells us that we really need to work more and find better treatments. Pimazolamide alone Plus or minus keep cytobin, which is the oral form of 5-FU uh, type of chemotherapy, is a category 2A recommendation per NCCN guidelines. How can we translate this? Well, NCCN options for advanced pulmonary nets would be observation. Evrolimus, as I mentioned, is the FDA approved. Well, there is octiriotide or lanariotide because that's the somatostatin analog in patients who have the somatostatin expression. Pimazolamide plus or minus kimpsitabin, as I mentioned, is sort of like great um, two like recommendation. And platinum etoposide, it's aggressive chemo that we give for the aggressive forms of like small cell lung cancer, but we can use it sometimes if the disease is very, very resistant and it's not really being controlled with any of the previous therapies. There is also a radionucleotide therapy um, that has been actually um, looked at in, you know, sort of like smaller studies um, in lung cancer. Of course, it's more wider studied in GI net tumors. But if the somatostatin receptor is positive and there's progression on the somatostatin analogs, uh, basically LU177 dotate, which is LU um, Lutathera is also uh, being studied um, in those circumstances. So somatostatin analogs in lung nets, basically its retrospective studies showed activity in lanariotide and octiriotide uh, long acting, and it's a reasonable um, option for metastatic disease. Limited data exists for anti-proliferative activity, however, so of course it is you know, for symptoms of like flushing, or as I mentioned, they're less common in thoracic um, nets. However, there is also an anti-proliferative activity in this uh, disease. There were there was a retrospective study for 61 patients showing that there is a 67% uh, atypical and 48% of functioning tumors. Um, they were treated with SSA. The best overall response was stable disease in 77% of this patient population. Median follow-up was 5.8 years, showing median progression-free survival of 17.4 um, and 58.4 months, respectively, for median progression-free survival. And as you see, the functioning tumors have a significantly longer progression-free survival of 28.7 months compared to 8.7 months in the dose of tumors that are not functioning. Patients with slowly versus rapidly progressive disease at six months had a progression-free survival of 26 
versus 4.5 months. So this means patients with functioning tumors or slowly growing tumors are going to have a longer time of stability and control in this disease category. For patients with initially rapidly progressive disease, highly aggressive atypical lung nets, which is probably atypical carcinoid, or those who have not really responded well to everolimus or cytotoxic regimens used for small cell lung cancer, we can utilize, I mean, of course, you know, we already mentioned cytotoxic chemotherapy, so probably that's carboetoposide. For patients with more indolent growth, um, then, you know, timazolamide and timazolamide kipsitabin we mentioned, 5-FU, the carbazine, epirobicin, um, capecitabins with other combinations, pigulated liposomal um, doxorobicin, that's the doxel. Um, if they have painful bone disease, radiation can be used in the palliative content. However, these are all smaller studies, and we still need to have more research to um, get us better treatment options. So treatment option for patients with symptoms of carcinoid syndrome that do not respond to SSA therapy include ablative treatments for liver metastasis, systemic antiproliferative therapy with cytotoxic agents, and also the peptide receptor radiation um, therapy for patients who um, progress on SSA. So these are the options as mentioned, but also remember clinical trials. Problem with lung nets, because they are not very common, that all the clinical trials would always have a hard time enrolling patients because they are not really having access to those studies or because it's very rare and basically the centers who have the clinical trials might not be available everywhere. So as you see, these are uh, the list of the studies that uh, were active in lung uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms. Everolimus, of course, um, it is a phase three study. This is really very, very successful because they had 63 patients um, enrolled for um, Everolimus and 27 who received the observation, which has been the standard of care because they didn't have any other option. So this study showed that progression-free survival for Ervolimus was 9.2 months compared to only 3.6 months of progression-free survival in patients who did not receive Ervolimus and were observed only, or in other words, we call it placebo. And they had hazard ratio of 0.5, 95% confidence interval, 0.28 to 0.88. No breakdown of typical versus atypical carcinoids in this um, specific study. However, there were other studies who are off-label um, therapy uh, options. So maybe lenarutide, which is the spinet study, um, presented at ESMO 2021. It was a phase three study as well. I was part of that, and I remember very well in my center, it was the University of Cincinnati, and we had a um, very hard time because whenever we have a patient, there was um, something about the enrollment in the study. So lenarutide was 51 compared to placebo of 26, 14%. Uh, um, so, um, that 14% uh, basically overall response rate compared to 0% in patients who did not receive lenalutide. So that's a proof that this study for the thoracic neuroendocrine tumors have an anti-proliferative activity and can shrink the tumor even more than everolimus. Progression-free survival was 16.6 months versus 13.6 months. That's also a higher progression-free survival for the placebo. But the good thing is it is split between typical and atypical. So typical had 29, 21.9 um, months versus 13.9 months. And that's obviously longer because it's um, better uh, uh, proliferation, uh, better uh, indolence. Uh, atypical was 13.8 months versus 11 months. So it did improve outcome. And that study, uh, chapeau for that study, because of course it took time, but it happened with lung nets. Timazolamide and capecitabin, um, 
basically it's a retrospective study of 20 patients, uh, no breakdown between typical and atypical, progression-free survival around like 13 months. Timazolamide, another um, retrospective study of 31 patients, progression-free survival 5.3 months. And basically, um, as we were mentioning for the nuclear medicine, Lutathera, um, phase two study of 34 patients showing progression-free survival of 18.5 months and basically um, did have um, that um, typical carcinoid of 20.1 months and atypical carcinoid of 15.7 months. Basically, this is not the regimen that we give in medical oncology. The patients should go with radiation, with the nuclear um, uh, part of the radiation in order to be able to receive that um, regimen. So um, what about immunotherapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and the role in those neuroendocrine tumors? Well, pembrolizumab in a phase one basket study had only nine patients, had 0% overall um, response rate uh, in the keynote 0 to 8 study. The Spartazilem, it's a single arm phase two study, and it had 30 patients of lung neuroendocrine neoplasms with overall response rate of 16.7%, progression-free survival 5.5 months. Nevo and Epi, in uh, basically one of the phase two studies, had 10 patients, and those 10 patients had overall response rate even better, 33%. Um, no uh, median progression-free survival assessment that we do have. Uh, NIVO and EPI is a cohort in the S1609 study, which is um, basically also a basket study, the DART and had six patients in the lung neuroendocrine tumors, having 33% also overall response rate. That's very typical of the EPNIVO given in another perspective. And still, um, we don't have the information with the progression-free survival, but anyways, it's good for the overall response rate. Okay, so that's with typical and atypical carcinoids, the uh, indolent types. What about the more aggressive types? So switching gears to large cell neuroendocrine cancer, as you see here, the, the table that we talked about, getting the section of large cell neuroendocrine cancers, it's 3% of lung cancers. So remember the 2% were typical and atypical. This is 3% of lung cancers. The five-year overall survival is 15 to 20%. So that's low. Older adults generally with smoking history are more... Um, um, like more of the population affected with the large cell neuroendocrine cancers. 40 to 50% of those patients will be metastatic at diagnosis. There will be advanced disease. They will be worse outcome. What is the challenge? What is the problem of this large cell neuroendocrine tumor? It is a very, very difficult to treat cancer. It's not very uh, well known. When they studied they have, it's not one disease, even though it's rare, but it's not one disease. It has type 1 and type 2, where type 1 has a mutational pattern similar to non-small cell lung cancer. So let's take a look. So basically, for small cell lung cancer panel, like type 2 with the, with the mutational panel, Small cell lung cancer tends to have P53 and retinoblastoma gene mutations, which is very typical for the type 2 of the large cell neuroendocrine cancer with their mutational pattern, where the type 1 mimics more of non-small cell lung cancer, having the P53, having the STK11 and KEEP1 mutations that you see like with the Keras and things like that. However, when we look closer with the gene expression, well, the gene expression of the large cell neuroendocrine cancer of the type 1 is matching more of that of small cell lung cancer. And the genetic expression of the type 2 mimics more non-small cell lung cancer. So the ASCL1 is high in, and the DLL3, which is expressed in 80% of small cell lung cancer are high in the type one. So this means that we are having difficulty to know 
where to go or treat patients with large cell neuroendocrine cancers. Should we treat them with a small cell lung cancer regimen or should we treat them with a non-small cell lung cancer regimen? Remember, they're sort of like half and half, the genomic profiling and the transcriptional profiling is mimicking both diseases, small cell and non-small cell. So looking at different, um, you know, uh, sort of like retrospective studies, having tumor samples, when they collected 467 samples of large cell neuroendocrine cancers, looked like the small cell lung cancer, like uh, tumors were in 24% and non-small cell like lung cancer in those uh, were 73%. Um, in this tumor population, the actionable genetic profiling is present there. The EGFR, ALK, KERAS, they're present. Even though not very high, we should check them. So basically, um, they can be present and they can be treated with targeted therapy. The MET exon 14 skipping mutation, in fact, is 2.4%. The KERAS G12C is 2.9%. The ALK can be found in 1.7%. And basically, 0.48% can have exon 19 or exon 21 um, EGFR mutations. So it's very critical that we do molecular profiling for these types of tumors. There's high tumor mutational burden, and the PZL1 positivity is 21.5%. So 300 patients, 300 of those large cell neuroendocrine and 800 of small cell lung cancer were studied, showing that, of course, the large cell neuroendocrine cancer still has high P53 retinoblastoma gene. So that's, you know, maybe less than small cell lung cancer, but still they are high and they are aggressive. The CDKN2A, it's very high here in large cell neuroendocrine cancer. Um, and um, basically it's also, um, but it's a lower level in small cell lung cancer. MIC can be in 14.7 compared to six in small cell lung cancer. Tumor mutational burden may be little less than small cell lung cancer. However, those tumors are also uh, sort of like having um, higher tumor mutational uh, burden. If you see the median and the 75th percentile, they do have high tumor mutational burden. So where do we go? How do we treat them? Well, basically, cis etoposide in small cell lung cancer versus large cell neuroendocrine cancer is not the same. So we do know when I give the platinum etoposide systemic treatment for small cell lung cancer, I get a very high response rate. I get like 60%, 70%, limited stages like even 85 to 90%. In those limit, uh, uh, large cell neuroendocrine cancer, basically you're looking at a lower um, response rate. The survival for small cell lung cancer is, you know, probably like close to a year. In large cell neuroendocrine cancer, the median overall survival is 7.7 .7 months and 10.2 months. So that's even worse than small cell lung cancer. And median progression-free survival may be similar to small cell lung cancer, 5.2 or 4.6 months. When we um, looked into studies that EP-NIVO, uh, basically, they have response rate of 22%. That's less than small cell lung cancer, but better than if you're looking at just the standard of care. The DART study had only three patients with large cell neuroendocrine cancer looking at their overall response rate for large cell neuroendocrine cancer, and they had 66% of the response rate. But again, it's it's basically epineve was still the same regimen. This looked at a larger number of patients. This looked only at three uh, patients. So we need more work in this area. What about the immune checkpoint inhibitors in general? So basically looking at immune checkpoint inhibitor, remember those patients are going to still to have PDL1 level checked and they're gonna have molecular profiling. So there are studies that looked at patients who had single agent IO, um, like that's two patients, chemo IO, and basically looking at their uh, median overall survival to be around a year, 12 months, and median progression-free survival about uh, 4.2 months. So it's probably the median overall survival, it's at least better than the 7.7 .7 months with the standard of care chemo, adding the immunotherapy or even uh, treating with immunotherapy. Um, immunotherapy, 
plus or minus chemotherapy in those uh, patients had um, best, better uh, outcomes with one and two year survival in this difficult to treat disease, 55% in one year survival and 25% would survive at two years. In non-immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, patients, they only had 32% living at a year and 18% living at two years. So there are ongoing trials, DERVA, in combination with carboetoposide, basically, in, um, followed by maintenance DERVA in metastatic large cell neuroendocrine cancer. But look at that. It's only like two trials. It's not like other types of lung cancer that you have um, that effort. Single trial of atezolizumab platinum etoposide for treatment of advanced large cell neuroendocrine cancer of the lung. Um, and that's the Alpine trial. Facts. So we all know when I treat non-small cell lung cancer, the non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer, which sometimes can fall into large cell neuroendocrine cancer, we use like platinum, pemetrixate, pembro, carbopem, pembro is very, very common. We have to pay attention. Pemetrixate efficacy in large cell neuroendocrine cancer was found to be very poor, maybe due to the higher level of thymidylate synthase expressed by this his two type compared to other non-small cell lung cancer subtypes. Historically, large cell neuroendocrine cancer may not respond to platinum etoposide as strongly as extensive stage small cell lung cancer. So that's why more effort should be taken there. Okay, so the last part of my talk. For small cell lung cancer, the most aggressive of all neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, Small cell lung cancer is poorly differentiated, as I mentioned. It occurs in 15%. Cigarette plays a role there. So nearly all patients of small cell lung cancer are current or former smokers or maybe passive smokers or maybe other um, you know, environmental pollution. Um, I would say I've seen in my life rare but can happen cases that have younger patients or patients who are not smokers. Small cell lung cancer is distinguished from non-small cell lung cancer by its pathologic features, as I showed previously in those pictures, that their rapid doubling times, they have high growth fractions. Basically, yes, you can still do the TNN classification, which is the tumor, the nodes, and the metastatic, uh, you know, sort of like disease classification, and um, where... Typically, small cell lung cancer is divided into limited stage, and limited stage in the language of lung cancer, on the language of non-small cell lung cancer, goes between stages one to three, where people can have one area, one hemithorax, one area of the lung affected, or one area of um, the, the body is affected, where it's just the lungs, where people can have radiation treatment, it goes within the radiation scope, where extensive stage, it's more extensive, it can go to the liver, to the brain, to distant organs. Um, in limited stage, sometimes, and I think many times, we have to have a multidisciplinary uh, tumor board or um, talks, because with the limited stage, I need to have my radiation oncology uh, colleague tell me, is this area feasible to have radiation or no? because medical oncologists are not going to decide for their colleagues from radiation. However, both American Joint Committee on Cancer and International Association for Study of Lung Cancer recommended tumor node metastatic staging of small cell lung cancer as well as non-small cell lung cancer. And up to date, there are more efforts from the ISLC to include molecular staging in addition to the TNM staging. And I did actually volunteer to, to talk to them uh, next time about the molecular staging of neuroendocrine tumors. So management of small cell lung cancer, basically historic standard for extensive stage small cell lung cancer. Oops. Um, so historic standard was, of course, the platinum etoposide, where uh, basically it is highly responsive with response rate of 61%, and that's more for extensive stage. Again, limited stage have higher response rate, maybe like 85%. That there's 10% complete response rate. 
non-durable benefit in spite of the high response rate. So even though they're so highly responsive, but the median progression-free survival is only 4.3 months. So those patients are going to have disease progression, mostly. The median overall survival was 8.6 months. Well, until we had in 2019 and 2022, the addition of immune checkpoint inhibitor and TPDL1 therapies with atezolizumab or dervalimab, both are approved and they have a moderate improvement. So as I mentioned the figure, this improved to like 11 months or 12 months of survival in those agents. So that's why more work is being done and more targets are being looked at. So basically, cell cycle and DNA damage repair, we're looking at RAPARP inhibitors, ATR inhibitors, ATN. I'm looking at SHLEF and 11, and I'll mention in the next slide, we have key targets. We check one, uh, OCRA. We have um, novel immunotherapy approaches, proliferative and survival signaling, and novel epigenetic targets. So... As we have our colleagues, um, you know, treating, of course, our non-small cell lung cancer, we have, of course, the EGFR, the ALK, the, the MET, the RET, the ROS, um, you know, the KERAS, and we still have an area of unknown, and we have the PDL1. one I, I sort of like made this up because PDL1 one in the older images, they always included this as triangle here, which I don't really imagine it as a triangle. I imagine it as an outside triangle because anybody with a KRAS or EGFR or ALK or so on, can have high expression of pdl one and it occurs in two-thirds of the cases. What about the small cell lung cancer? Imagination also, because we have subtypes like A, P, and um, Y subtype and N subtype. So those subtypes um, can be potential um, for targeted therapies. And also we have the SHLEFN11, which is maybe between 50 to 70% the PLCG2 and the DLL3, which is 80%. And these also sort of like maybe like the PDL1 with different level of expressions. I think also I should add another one, which is the notch, which is 30% of small cell lung cancer. So we are getting there. Okay, so what's next? We looked at PARP inhibitors. Looks like there is high PARP expression uh, noted by immunohistochemistry in small cell and large cell neuroendocrine tumors. So what about having a PARP inhibitor, right? Well, the most potent PARP inhibitor was found to be telazoprid, right? So next, well, looks like it's not only a novel agent, but a novel agent that comes hand in hand with a predictive biomarker. When they had retrospective studies having patients with SLEFN11 positive status, and that's a slide showing the SLEFN11 positive, and that's the negative status. If they're treated with a PARP inhibitor, which is valaparib with temozolamide, patients with SLEFN11 positive, they survived 12.2 uh, months compared to patients who had SLEFN11 negative who had survived only for 7.5 months. So obviously, there is a positive impact on PARP inhibitors when treating patients with SLEFN11 positive disease. So um, I had, of course, the, the um, extreme honor um, to participate with um, SWOG and lead a study to have a PARP inhibitor, uh, Thalazopera, um, basically in combination with atezolizumab in the maintenance setting. So those patients would first get their carbo or cis etoposide. Uh, plus atezolizumab, um, you know, at least two cycles complete of those three agents. Uh, first cycle is okay to go without the atezolizumab. Then only Schlafen 11 positive patients were uh, enrolled to receive either the standard of care atezo versus atezolizumab plus telazoprib until disease progression with the primary endpoint of progression pre-survival it's a maintenance study, so we want to make sure that those patients would continue the treatment for longer time until the disease progresses. The study was activated in June 2020, and it took two years. Instead, in spite of the COVID, we were able to finalize the study in 2022. The screening goal was 332. Basically, we didn't have to reach 332. 
2023 because we had 309 patients who already were available for the Schlafen 11 um, results and uh, basically 204 of them were positive for Schlafen 11, making 79% of the small cell lung cancer population in that study Schlafen 11 uh, positive, randomized 106 patients. It was so easy to um, get the Schleffen 11 testing that more than 90% of patients had uh, four days only to check it. Median was five um, days. So um, basically, um, I just gonna go back. The results are uh, going to be uh, you know, uh, presented uh, soon, so uh, stay tuned. Basically, there are more efforts combining immune checkpoint inhibitors with lorbenectidine or, you know, other agents to look also to stabilize the disease or to, to wait longer before it becomes progressive. There are CAR-T bites, which is more aggressive, um, but really it targets DLL3 that I mentioned before in 80% of small cell lung cancer. They used it for all comers though, and it's one of those therapies that we have to monitor the patients for inflammatory conditions. So patients, you know, can have basically like uh, pyrexia, like high fevers, sweating, um, you know, but, and they have to be um, hospitalized. Uh, so that's one way. And basically they're all like, as I mentioned, the uh, inflammatory side effects, pneumonitis um, and encephalopathy were very, very severe, happened, but they're very rare. Response rate 20%. Um, they had 30% at higher doses. The median duration of response was 8.7 months. We will continue to hear more as they develop this drug for um, the DLL3. So I don't know if you uh, see uh, that slide. For me, it's a little bit uh, tricky here, uh, but basically um, um, take home message is that immunotherapy along with chemotherapy established standard of care management for treatment of naive uh, extensive stage small cell lung cancer. And basically we wanna really look into limited stage small cell lung cancer because it's still um, more effort to look into if we need to add um, basically immune checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy in this stage. The PARP inhibitors, all the other innate immunity, their investigational efforts, it's not the standard of care, looking at personalized approach therapies, looking at um, basically re-challenging again the patients with the primary treatment if they stayed for more than six months. Um, you know, stable on it or not progressive, uh, switching the induction, continuation of immunotherapy uh, basically um, needs more knowledge. So we like to have efforts for awareness for um, lung cancer. So that's my image with my friends from SWAG and uh, Dr. Islam Shaheen also like from Augusta University. And we had the white ribbons, we carried them all the way from here, of course, to Egypt to have an event by the pyramids to raise awareness about uh, lung cancers in general, including, of course, the lung neuroendocrine tumors. And that's me, of course, um, trying my best to prepare. And my cat likes to also work with me on the computer. So having said that, I will um, stop sharing. Mm, how can I um, close sharing? Or Thank you. Let's see how can I stop sharing. Thank you so much, Nava, sure. for this wonderful Thanks. presentation. We really enjoyed that and learned a lot about lung neuroendocrine tumors. Um, I do have a question, but let me go ahead and open it up to the floor. If anyone has any questions um, for our speaker, please do ask. I have a question, and probably uh, Rachel will have similar question. I so, bet. <laughs> so you show that um, large cell um, uh, uh, neuroendocrine and pulmonary cancers have a uh, notch pathway active. Yes. One type or another type is, is uh, indolent. So do we know um, specifically which notch isoform, one, two, three, is upregulated or downregulated in those tumors, cancers? 
Yeah, I don't have this information. However, I would tell you that this is a very hot topic that we are actually working on. Um, so I think I'm collaborating with a, a colleague of mine um, to look into um, those findings. Right. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. next time I present, I can have more uh, data on that. You know, I will show you also because that this is coincident that I have handy. We are also working on SSTR2 uh, targeting uh, okay. neuroendocrine pulmonary cancers. And this is just, we have SSTR2 TM, SS, I mean, uh, pulmonary carcinoids TMAs. And this is stains for SSTR2. Wow. If anyone is interested, we found that uh, around 75% um, patients are including um, typical and atypical carcinoids. However, we have only two patients with atypical carcinoids are um, um, SSTR2 positive. Unfortunately, atypical carcinoids, both patients are SSTR2 negative. Renata, do you mind if we exchange emails, please? Because I think, you know, that would be very useful. Um, yeah. I have a panel of studies that we're trying to, to do for our thoracic neuroendocrine um, tumor. And um, basically, like someone is 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 proposing um, an, something, but I think, you know, for us, we can um, explore more for those translational yes, components. You, yes, if you have ideas for other uh, markers, we, yeah. uh, we have only SSTR2. Okay. I think uh, what I remember, we have um, 60, 16 patients here. And okay. I think we have probably, um, this is white and black population. So this will be very interesting to look at. Yeah. This. yeah. So, and this is, as you see, scored by pathologists. I was sitting with the pathologist and pathologist was scoring. So if uh, we have those TMAs and if uh, I can talk to to um, this pathologist, if we can make more um, yeah. TMAs, but if you will have any ideas, um, what else can be detected? Yeah. And if patients, this, this, we, we can definitely do this. Perfect. I have connect you guys. Yeah. One uh, path. I put my uh, email on the chat, and I have one pathologist and one translational medicine, and and other colleagues like working on a neuroendocrine, um, low grade. Actually, in fact, we're doing also a paper. Um, you know, to to have retrospective, like not retrospective, to have like a review to to put all those together in a paper. So I would um, greatly appreciate if we can, you know, um, do that together. That would yeah, be perfect. wonderful. Yes, no problem. Just let me know. Or Rachel, yes. of course, we are working together. So really doesn't yes. matter. Okay, thank you. Very nice. Yeah, this is exciting. Yes. Thank you. So I think, you know, I, I would say that this is, I'm very passionate about this topic because unfortunately it doesn't have a lot of uh, support. You know what I mean? So so uh, that's why I'm like, you know, we, we need to do some more work here. So, yeah, these, you know, as you're talking, these response rates, you know, and median progression free survival, we are so low, but we're kind of used to that because that's what we're working with. Um, but, you know, it's heartbreaking. And I think it really, as you were talking, I was like, this needs so much more attention, so much more research. You know, can we not, we got to do better. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you so Any much. Any other questions? I have also another comment. What I remember from our Netherab and Nanit's meeting, the good thing for um, uh, pulmonary neuroendocrine tumors is that um, they can grow in, um, some of them can grow in the PDXs and organoids. So I think this is the only type of neuroendocrine tumors uh, uh, from, from which uh, the PDXs are already made. So I think this is, um, this is very promising that um, uh, on those models, um, we can do a, a, and test uh, more drugs on therapeutics. So the thing here is, could you imagine like we have, um, like even though carcinoid is rare, but you do have resections, 
right? So you do have tumor tissue and mm -hmm. you do have an opportunity to do more translational. Mm -hmm. We need actually a better networking to have better prospective studies because if we are looking at you know, very small studies or retrospective that don't yes. put us together. I think the networking and 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 I did speak actually in a patient net um, before uh, live also in in Indiana. But I think like the more and more we get connected together, especially that it's a rare cancer, um, those studies will do much better. Yes, of course, be therapeutics and confirm, validate what we are finding. In this retrospective studies, we definitely have to have prospective and, and tissues and PDXs and preclinical models. Right. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, great, great presentation, Narga. It's really nice to hear. It's so encouraging that you 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 you're presenting the new clinical trials and all that too. So we'll we'll follow up on the news and all that. Um, you'll yeah. work closely. Um, I just want to uh, touch on the point where, like, like you and uh, Renata discuss about the PDX. We do have like a new um lung uh, neck a PDX model that has not been published yet that we just recently uh, generated in our lab in collaboration with Wash U because they have a, a PDX center and then we so we we help do to, to do the neuroendocrine part so um, just throwing it out there just in case if you guys want to uh, move on and all that and or, or if you need a model I'm very happy to provide and everything yeah I think you know this would be um I think this would be a great start point for, um, I'm collaborating with a, a great, great colleague of mine um, in translational. She has a lab. And of course, I'm a clinician, but I always have to be friends with my lab. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? Because that's the only way to get uh, the new molecules and new therapies yeah. to our patients. Um, so I think, you know, this really needs um, to have, you know, our connection together. If we can be on you know, the same email with Renata and we can, you know, go to the next step. But stay tuned, please, for my um, study because I'm going to, um, you know, uh, say the results soon. Of course, I cannot say them today, yeah, yeah. but, um, you know, stay tuned. Thank you. Also, another question to Paul. Um, do you know, uh, like, genetic profile of those PDXs and, and targets? Um, so, um, we know what is expressed. Of course, we are interested in SSCR2, but also other genes. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. Like I said, it's we were still there's they're more near the final stage. We uh, know that we can passage like this one. Uh, we passage it into uh four generation now, and it's reproducible. We did send it for like like uh just like um um forensic testing to confirm if it's not like a previously existing model and and it was confirmed as this is this is a brand new one that nobody else has reported before so it, it just gives us more confidence that mm -hmm. this is um, a, a successful new one but uh but yeah we we haven't sent it for uh sequencing and um uh, expression checked and all that but i uh it, at least we checked it in our lab for the neuroendocrine tumor markers and, and they, they are expressed, but uh, yeah, there's more that we haven't done. So probably, you know, if the PDX will be established, you can also make cell line from, from this PDX. Right. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. They are they grow quite well. Um, this this one. Um, but yeah, it it's it's hard, but it's it's one of the few yes, that we, we get. <laughs> I'm really curious what, what markers, especially as is the R2. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, SSCR2 is present, definitely. It's I present. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much. I am so honored, you know, to be here today and, you know, looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, recapping again with more results. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Great. great. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Can I just remind you all, just before you go, that our next net chat is 27th of April. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you very much Nagla for your talk. And I'm very excited with the prospect of this collaboration, just what yes. this was set up for. So really exciting.
Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Selena, thank for you. bringing us all together with <laughs> yeah. this foundation and with the net chatter. It's really, it's really amazing. It's amazing. It's been, it's been really good. So thank you very much for coming. And I see you all next month, hopefully. See you. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.